If you have your copy of God's Word, you can take it and turn, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to look at one verse there in a few moments. But uh, we've been focusing, and I would imagine that uh, a lot of people's focus is on gift buying this week. If, if not, maybe guys, it should be. This is your last week. You, you need to go out and get her done. And um, uh, this is your last week as well to get off the naughty list and uh, to get on the nice list and to uh, uh, make sure that you've got your, your bases covered. But uh, I, I just want to ask you, how many of you are going to take the easy route and buy a gift card? That's it? You're, not, you're, you're just going to, you're going to buy a real present, really? Do you know you're in the mino, minority if you do that? Do you know 59% of Americans now say they're going to buy gift cards for someone? And the interesting thing is only 27% say they actually want a gift card. Most people want to have a gift that they're surprised by, that the, some thought has been put into, there, there's some meaning put into it, and, and you actually uh, do the work of trying to buy something that, that's special for someone. And yet, we, we've kind of got to this place where we take the easy road. We're going to buy the gift card. I came across some other interesting facts about Christmas gifts this, this week. Listen to this. Only one-third of gifts actually given are a surprise. Only one third. Uh, we don't even try anymore. We just ask each other what we want and we just go, go do it. And it kind of just goes that way. Listen to this one. 75% of people say they're going to lie about liking at least one present this year. <laughs> now, come on, folks. You can get by with, without lying. Just be creative. When, when you get a gift you don't like, just look at it and say, oh, you shouldn't have. <laughs> and in your mind, you're really thinking, you shouldn't have. You know, do something like that. You don't have to lie about it. There's other ways. 50% will return a gift, donate it, or re-gift it. And that's, that's pretty popular, isn't it? I used to do it with my dad all the time. Uh, re, re-gift it. And, and listen, this, this will really cheer you up, presents, or parents about presents. One in ten toys you buy for your children will be broken by the new year. One in ten. Now, aren't you thankful that the gifts that God gives to us are a lot different? That's been our focus these weeks as we approach Christmas. God's indescribable gift. And we've been using 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. And it'll come up on the screen and, and uh, uh, it goes like this. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And this morning we're going to focus on his indescribable gift of peace. We've previously focused on his indescribable gift of love. He loves us unconditionally. We focused on his indescribable gift of hope, how there's always hope because of Jesus Christ. We focused on his indescribable gift of joy, how he gives us a joy on the inside that goes far beyond what this world can provide. Now this week, we're going to focus on his indescribable gift of peace. In this verse in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, God clues us in not only on who Jesus is by giving us his names, but, but also he, he gives us some direction and some understanding about what Jesus came to do. You see, there are over 700 names. Do you, do you know that over 700 names in the Bible attributed to Jesus Christ? 700 names or titles. And the reason that is because in, in Bible times, a, a name would give uh, a direction toward that person's character or their their attribute or, or their personality or their purpose, what they came to do. And so no one name could be given to Jesus Christ that would describe all that he is and all that he came to do. So we have 700 names in scripture that give us that description. Now, what we know about someone depends on how, what we call them in, in that relationship. In other words, I can say it like this. There's one person in this world that calls me sweetheart. <laughs> There's one person left in this world that calls me son. 
There are two in this world that call me dad. There are five in this world that call me papa. There's a whole bunch in this world that call me idiot. But uh, uh, I just say that to say, what you might call me, what you might refer to each other as depends on your relationship with that person. And it's the same with Jesus Christ. Because uh, he has been my satisfaction, I know him as the Bible describes him as the bread of life. Because he has led me in the decisions that, that I've needed to uh, sort through in life, I, I've come to know him as my shepherd. Because he has consoled me and, and, and helped me in the times when I'm hurting, I know him as my comforter and on and on and on. Proverbs 18 and verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are safe. You can run into the name of the Lord, run into his person and all that he is that we see described in his names and experience him for who he really is. That's why I want to get to know him more and more and more as I go through life. I was interested this week to just kind of sort through some different meanings of names. And I thought you might be interested in some of them. One of them, uh, Tammy. Uh, the name Tammy means perfection and she is to me now it's interested to see uh, the name mark <laughs> means warlike <laughs> i've got to quit calling him foo foo <laughs> his name means warlike the name brent means high place <laughs> pretty true huh pretty accurate. So we can see some, some accuracy in these names. Now, you guys are not going to believe me, so you're going to need to get out your iPhone at this moment and Google meaning of the name Kevin. You're not going to believe me, but it's truth. Here it is. Handsome. I'm telling you, it's true. The name Kevin means handsome. And, and we can see the accuracy right before your very eyes. You know, never, look in the bulletin, never has Brent looked so good. What a compliment he got today. But let's look at these names in Isaiah chapter 9. And I, I want you to see the beauty of, of God's word here all these hundreds of years before Christ was born, God prophesied through the prophet Hosea what his name would be. Now, look at these, these names as his birth is foretold. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful. Do you know Jesus is wonderful? I mean, he is wonderful. He is so wonderful. That takes care of all the dullness of life. You think life is dull? You need to encounter Jesus Christ in his fullness because he is wonderful. Takes care of the dullness of life. His name is Counselor. He's a great counselor. Do you know what? If we will turn to him and let him be our counselor, let him be our guide, let him direct us in all our decisions in life, you won't need a do-over. His name is Counselor. That takes care of all the decisions of life. He's wonderful. He's Counselor. He's Mighty God. He's Mighty God. That means when, when we know Him in that personal relationship, He empowers us. He gives us strength to do everything He's called us to do. So you put those two together. He gives us counsel to know what we need to do. And then He's Mighty God. He gives us the, the empowerment to do everything He calls us to do. What good would it be to know what you need to do but not have the ability to do it or have the ability to do it but not know what you need to do? So He's wonderful counselor and it all goes together. Isn't that amazing? that takes care of the decisions of life he's wonderful that takes care of the dullness he's counselor that takes care of the decisions he's mighty God that takes care of all the demands of life he's everlasting father everlasting father always going to be 
your heavenly father, faithful to the very end, that takes care of the dimensions of life. From the time you begin to walk with him to the time he calls you home, he's your everlasting father who's going to be faithful to you. But he's also prince of peace. And that's what we're going to focus on today. He is the prince of peace. That takes care of all the disturbances of life. Because life is going to be full of disturbances, isn't it? But he has said, I... I'm going to be your peace through it all. And hundreds of years before Christ was born, the prophet Isaiah said, he's going to be your prince of peace. Through all of life's disturbances, you can have peace. I want to show you a couple things about the peace that Jesus came to give. Do you know there are seven, over 700 verses about peace in scripture. This morning, we're going to look at every one of them. i <laughs> just teasing. <laughs> That'd make a Methodist have a cow, wouldn't it? I mean, uh, we're going to just look at, at just some, just a few things here. Can't stand too much of God's word. But uh, we're going to look at some, some things here about God's peace. You know, peace is a buzzword at Christmas time. Let's talk about it. First, think about the kinds of peace that Jesus came to give. The kinds of peace. You could sum it up as we look at three different types of peace that the Bible talks about. And I want to show them to you. The first one, the first kind of peace that Jesus came to give is an upward peace. Now, would you look at me for just a moment? It's Christmas. But we're going to talk about something heavy for a few moments, okay? And before we can get into the good news of what Christmas means for you and I, we've got to accept the bad news. The good news isn't good news without the bad news. Until I came to an understanding of my wretchedness apart from Jesus Christ, the good news meant nothing to me. The gospel meant nothing to me. And so I had to start with the bad news. And so it's going to be heavy here for a few moments. And I'm probably going to show you a couple things you've never seen before in the Bible. But I hope that you will see them. And here is where we got to start. Since the beginning, since man and woman sinned in the garden... It's been this way. Since the beginning, every single person who is born into this world comes into this world fighting against God in opposition toward God. And listen, God is your enemy. Whoa. Why? Because our human flesh is born in sin. We are born in sin. Kicking and screaming against God. That's why Jesus came. So that he could come in and stand between us and God as a mediator. And bring us settling to this war that we're at with God. And bring us to the place where we, if we will place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we'll no longer be at opposition against God, but we'll be at peace with God. Let me show you what what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Now this is in the message. Listen to this. I love the way it worded it. You yourselves are a case study of what he does, Jesus Christ. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God. That's all of us apart from Christ. Our backs are turned toward God. We think in a rebellious way. We have rebellious thoughts toward him. We give him trouble every chance we get. But now, by Jesus giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together 
whole and holy in his presence. Here's the gift idea again. Why would you want to walk away from a gift like that? Because that's what Jesus has done for you and for me. That's what he came to do. That's why he was born. Every one of us is all about doing our own thing. We're determined to do so. And the bottom line reason that our lives are empty and lacking in peace is because we're resisting God and fighting against him. You know, so many people, they, they, they want and expect to have peace in their lives. But friend, what we've got to understand, you're never going to have peace in your life while you exclude Jesus from your life. It's never going to happen. So how does peace come? Paul talked about it in, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Look at what he says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are at odds with God apart from Jesus Christ. Something needs to give if you're going to have peace. Thank God Jesus did it because you couldn't do it. And I couldn't do it. And no matter where we've been or what we've done, listen, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, the battle can be over. We can have peace with God. We can have this, this battle end. Listen, friend, peace will come no other way. You're never going to have peace because money can't buy it. The doctor can't prescribe it. A divorce won't settle it. A vacation won't bring it. You won't find it in drugs or alcohol. You won't get it going to the shopping mall or getting everything you want for Christmas. It only comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Why are you trying to look outside of Jesus to find what only He can bring in your life? It won't happen. And here's another thing. I can't formulate it into a message and make you feel good enough to walk out of here with peace. You will, you will uh, be very frustrated if you expect that. I'm coming to church and I hope Kevin or Brent or whoever just, just makes me feel good and then I will have peace. Look at what the prophet Jeremiah said. Hundreds of years before Christ was born. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike. Listen, he's talking to the preachers. And he's saying, you're greedy and you practice deceit. They dr Listen to this. How do they do that? They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. In other words, there, there's brokenness in God's people. When we fight against God, when we try to do our own thing, when we resist what God wants to do in our life, when we're rebellious in our sin, we're going to be wounded. We're going to be hurt. God says, man, the preachers that just stand before people and say, oh, it's not all that serious. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. In other words, standing before God's people and saying, oh, you know, it's, it's all right. You know, we're, we're all just happy and we're all eventually going to get there. And as long as you're sincere and in your belief toward a higher power, we're all going to get there. I had that told to me one time said, man, they said, Kevin, why are you so strict on, the, on this narrow way that it has to be Jesus? What about the Buddhists? What about the, the Muslim? What about the other religions of this world? Listen, you can be sincere, but sincerely wrong. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. It only comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I can't stand before you and offer you any other way. There's going to be wounds that we encounter in life, and many of my wounds have been self-inflicted because of my continued rebelliousness toward God. And yet God is trying to 
work to bring me to an acknowledgement of my sin. So I'll deal with it through the provision of Christ on the cross. Friend, that's the only way. The fact that you're rejecting and fighting against God is going to wreck your life. If you're that person, you say, man, you know, I, I can just kind of do my life, my own thing. And you know what? It's Christmas. I checked in at church. Check. We do have church the other 50 Sundays out of the year besides Christmas and Easter. I'm glad you're here. God's glad you're here. But if you're counting on that to bring you that ultimate fulfillment that you're deep down searching for in life, you're not going to find it. And I can't stand before you and say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Let me show you some verses that you may have skipped over in your Bible reading. In 2 Chronicles, God's people had rebelled against him. Do you know, listen to me. He's talking about God's people. He's talking about you. He's talking about you, Brent, you, John, you, Bill. He's talking about us, God's people. He's talking to us and, and those times that we let our guard down. And in those times, there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on the inhabitants in the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, for the devil troubled them with every adversity. Is that what it says? Who troubled them? God would be my troubler? You mean, here on Christmas, Kevin, you want to tell me that God's going to trouble me? God's going to wound me? God's going to allow me to be wounded? And to go through times where there's a lack of peace in my life? That's a curveball, isn't it? Because in the midst of the chaos, we want to think, well, the devil, he's just out to get me. The devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. Listen. There's sometimes it's God. And if you don't get anything else, would you get this? If God is your greatest problem, only God can be your solution. And there's times we got to realize my problem is not the devil. It's not the Republicans, the Democrats, the Baptists, the Methodists, the economy. Or anything, my problem is God. And before God is ever going to be your protection, He's your problem. Before He's your provider, He's your problem. Before He's your power, your plan, or your peace, He's your problem. And friend, in this battle in life, I hope you'll make it your priority to get on the right side of this battle and, and quit fighting against God and start fighting with God. I don't want to be God's enemy. Look at what Isaiah 63, 10, verse, uh, uh, 63 and verse 10 says. But they rebelled and grieved His Spirit. Listen, you know who grieves God's Spirit? His children. And what happens when we do? God says, you're no longer fighting with me. You're my enemy. Man, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an enemy of God. I want to make peace with God. I don't want to do battle with God. And when you reject God, when you put, put God on the back burner in your life and, and, and you're rebellious and, and, and things aren't where they need to be in your relationship with God, you're putting yourself in a place where you're fighting against God and that is consequently the reason why you don't have peace in your life. Quit blaming everybody else. It's not your wife. It's not your husband. It's not everybody else. It's here. You see, I've never been a fighter. 
And that's pretty understandable, isn't it? I've never been a fighter. I, I love to watch fights. You, you fight, I'll come watch. Uh, I, I love to watch fights. When I, before I was married, I lived with this guy. And uh, he was a, uh, the state heavyweight wrestling champion. I went to school with him and everything. We moved in together. And, and he, John loved to fight. And I loved to watch him. I would follow him around on the weekends with my lawn chair in the back of my truck because John was going to get in a fight and I wanted to see it. <laughs> Always. Don't like to fight. But I love to watch him. But you know what I did do for years? I fought against God. I thought I could do my own thing and just fight, resist what God wanted for my life. Until I came to the place where I was so wounded in life, I had to realize, man, I can't keep going like this. I need to make peace with God. Friends, sooner or later, you're going to realize that. I just hope it's before it's too late. Jesus came to bring us upward peace. But he also came to bring us inward peace. Peace on the inside. He came to bring peace within. You see, there's a difference between peace with God and the peace of God. Do you have the peace of God in your heart? Do you have it? You see, once you've made peace with God, the peace of God becomes a possession. And there's a couple things here. Number one, what I've determined, I've determined if I don't have anything else in life, I want God's peace. I'm telling you, it's the greatest possession that I have through a relationship with Christ. I want His peace. Because if I don't have His peace, life is not worth living. I'd rather die than to not be at peace within my heart. I'm serious. I would rather die than not have God's peace. I've determined that. But I've also discovered that no matter what I go through in life, I can have God's peace. Because God's peace is not based on circumstances. It's not based on what's going on around me. It's based on who is present in me. And that's where we get confused. We think, well, I'm going to have peace when? No, you're going to have peace if Jesus rules. And if Jesus lives inside of you, when Jesus was getting ready to exit this world and go to a cross and die for us, he was meeting with his disciples and he gave some words about peace and they apply to us. Look at what he said in John 14, verse 27. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the, world's, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And in John 16, look at what Jesus said. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, everything's going to go smooth. And you're always going to be happy. And that's going to be the provision for your peace. Is that what he said? It doesn't even say that in the Living Bible. Listen to what it said. In the world, you will have tribulation. Life's going to get hard. Life's going to stink sometimes. It's not going to go your way. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I'm going to give you my peace. And he gave those words in the midst of a world where there was war and slavery and, and poverty, just like in our, in our world today. Look at the headlines. You look at the headlines each and every day and you think, man, how can there be peace on earth through Jesus Christ? It's through his indwelling presence in our lives. You see, when I, I give my life to Jesus and I surrender to him, he comes to live inside of me through the presence of his Holy Spirit. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is what? Love, joy, 
peace. It's Holy Spirit given. We have inward peace. When we have peace with God, that makes the peace of God possible in our life. That enables us to look at life, no matter what's going on around, going on around us, and say, all is well. It's going to be all right. Someone said, well, why, if God wants us to have peace, why doesn't he just get rid of all this turmoil in my life? Why doesn't he get rid of all this hardship in my life? Why do I have to go through these hard circumstances? Well, here's the reason why. When did you get serious about Jesus? When did you give your life to Him? When do you really just give all to Him? Is it when the road's smooth or the road's a little rough? Is it when you come to that time of desperation and you realize that life is over your head? That's exactly right because it drives us deeper in Jesus. Tammy and I have sat on the California coast uh, uh, many times and just watched the waves of the, of the ocean come in. And man, they're massive at times and they're, 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 they're huge. But do you know just a few feet down, it's calm. And it's that way in life sometimes. On the surface, it's overwhelming. But the deeper you go in Jesus, the more peace you'll find. That's why the, the Korean Christians said it like this. I loved it. Because of the persecution they suffer and the, and, the, and the things that they go through. They said, we're just like nails. The harder you hit us, the deeper you drive us. And the deeper you drive us, the more peaceful it is. The very reason you may not be at peace today because all hell is breaking loose in your life, the very reason you may not be at peace is because you're not going deep in Jesus. You're a surface Christian. You're not in the Word. You're not, you're not serious about your walk with God. That's where that inward peace comes from. Friend, I want to tell you, there's nothing like going to bed. And Tammy and I were driving home from Texas yesterday. And I looked over at Tammy and I was thinking about this sermon, trying to think about what I might say. And I, I, was thinking about, I said, Tammy, do you have peace? Real peace. And she said, yes, I do. And she said, do you? I said, absolutely. And I want to tell you, there's nothing like being able to go to bed tonight, at night, when everything's not all right, and be able to look at the ceiling and know it's going to be all right. Because I have an inward peace. And life may not go my way. But He's going to give me the peace to sustain me through what I go through in life. But see this, we have an upward peace through Jesus Christ. We have an inward peace through the peace that Christ gives us. But we also have an outward peace through the peace that Christ gives us. Look at what Paul said in, in Ephesians. He's talking about the need for, for peace on the outside. He said, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Being all about peace outwardly. You see, when I'm at peace with God, and I have peace inwardly, then that peace also manifests itself outwardly in my relationships. You see, the reason why you as husbands and wives sometimes we, we, we don't have peace in our relationship is because we've got an internal war going on and we're just lashing out. It's not your wife that did it. It's not your wife that made you grouchy. You're just grouchy looking for a place to grouch. And so Christ comes in. He wants to take over and change the atmosphere of your heart so that those closest to you will benefit from the peace that you have in your heart and it brings peace into your marriage. You ever notice that? Man, the reason I'm overbearing, the reason I grasp the me, reason I'm cranky, the reason that I just don't have a good word to say, especially to those closest to me, and I'm hurting those that I love the very most in life, is because I've got this internal war going on. And my problem's really with God. And if I'd settle it with God, I'd have a settling in my relationships. So let me ask you, how is it in your home how is it in your marriage this Christmas? Guys, wives, 
Maybe the best thing you could do for your home this Christmas is get serious about your relationship with God so His peace could flood your heart, could flood your marriage, could flood your home and change the very atmosphere in your home. Wouldn't that be a great Christmas? Something that would last far more than the Christmas present you don't really like? And I want His peace. It's kind of like the guy whose wife said, now I want for Christmas, she was thinking of a sports car. She said, honey, I want something for Christmas that'll go from zero to 200 in less than 10 seconds. She was thinking he was going to get her a sports car. He got her something that would go from zero to 200 in less than 10 seconds. A set of scales. <laughs> That's not what she had in mind. <laughs> I do not suggest... I just wondered if y'all were listening. <laughs> You're listening. You know why? Because you want peace. Survey of all men was taken asking them what they wanted for Christmas more than anything else. You know what they said? Number one answer. Peace in my home. Guys, I went down to Texas this week, saw our son-in-law graduate with his doctorate for, for ministry. And I sat there through that graduation. I bawled like a baby. I was so embarrassed. I did. And it was tears of regret because I thought, why couldn't I have had my act together to have prepared for ministry like this? And here I am, the Elmer Fudd of all preachers, and, and, I, and I didn't have it together. And I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling, and I'm never really going to amount to that much. I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, I beat myself up. And then I looked across the aisle where my daughter was sitting with my two grandchildren. I looked to this side, and there was my son prepared for ministry. And I thought, you know what? I'm so glad. I may not have gotten a lot of things right, but here's what I did. It's 29 years ago, I settled it. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Christ is going to be in the center. We're going to, uh, uh, we're, we're going to make everything centered around Him. We may not get anything else right, but Christ is going to be in the center of our marriage and our home and our child raising and to the best of my ability, I'm going to surrender my life to Him. Let His peace flood my life so our home can be filled with His peace. I want to be a peacemaker starting in my marriage and in my home. You know what saddens me so much is when I, when I hear wives who wouldn't describe their, their husbands as a person of peace whose children wouldn't describe their fathers as a peacemaker, as someone that models peace. He came to give us upward peace, inward peace, and outward peace. Now I want to quickly show you the keys to having this peace that Jesus wants to give you. Very quickly, I want to leave you with this. If you want this peace... Give Jesus control. Isn't that amazing, that message that was given when Christ was born in Luke 2, verses 13 and 14? It was announced that He would bring peace and goodwill toward men. Now, that's not yet been done. There's not going to be total peace on earth until Christ comes again and rules and reigns as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But I can tell you this, wherever Jesus rules and controls, there's peace. So the question is, is He ruling and controlling your life? The evidence will be that you're at peace because He is the Prince of Peace. And when He controls, there will be peace. Let me ask you this Christmas. What is it that's eating your lunch? I can tell you what it is with every person in here. Here's what's eating your lunch. The things you can't control. 
And that's why there's so many self-help books that are written about getting control of your life. And we buy into that and we think, okay, I'm going to get control of my schedule. I'm going to get control of my marriage. I'm going to get control of my children. I'm going to get control of my finances. I'm going to get control, control, control. I'm going to get control. And it's never going to come by you getting control. You're going to have peace when Christ has control of you. Where He controls, there's peace. You know that when I need that peace the very most, when I'm in the midst of decisions, listen, as I'm making decisions in my life, should I do this, should I do that, and it's not black and white, do you know what I go by more than anything is the presence and absence of peace? Do I have peace as I've prayed, as I search God's Word, as, I, as I'm trying to lay it out before the Lord? Do I have peace about this? I had a guy sit in my office not long before we moved to Chillicothe, and he said, you know what, Kevin? I made a decision. And I knew when I made the decision and I signed my name on the dotted line, I knew it was the wrong decision because I did not have peace. And I ignored the absence of peace. And I made the decision anyway. And as he sat and told me his story, he went through bankruptcy, he lost everything they had. His life went through turmoil, not because he was a bad person rejecting God and, and just, just all out blatantly rebelling against God, but just because he was a determined person to do his own thing. And he ignored the absence of peace. But I want to tell you, when, when the peace isn't there, I want to back up and go back to the fork in the road where I lost his peace, and I want to get back where his peace is a reality in my life. And if, if I don't have peace about going in a direction, I, I ain't going. Where he controls, there's peace. Give him control. Secondly, if you want this peace, give Jesus your confession. Give him your confession. In Isaiah 57 and verse 21, the Bible says there is no peace for the wicked. God has so orchestrated it that if you choose to rebel in your own sin and do your own thing, you're never going to have peace. There is no peace for the wicked. So, I want to ask you this question that's, going to, that's on the screen. Is the thrill of your sin worth the sacrifice of your peace? That's a question to wrestle with, isn't it? Is it worth it? It's not going to be one day. If you ignore it now, and if you try to come up with a false peace, one day it's going to catch up with you. The thrill of your sin is not worth the sacrifice of your peace. That's why we need to come back to the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Look at what he said. You will keep, God will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on him. Friend, you can have peace. Some of you could have peace today if before you left here, you just get before God and agree with Him about the sin that's going on in your life, about the lies that you're telling, about the way you're living, about the rebellion you've got, and you know it's there. God's been knocking on your heart. God's been working in your life, trying to draw you to Himself, getting the junk out of your life. There's guys in this room, you've got pornography going on, you've got lies going on, you've got, you've got profane talk going on. You didn't even look like a Christian this week. And you come in here and you want me to say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And there won't be until you confess it and get it right. Give Him control. Give Him your confession. And give Him your confidence. Give Jesus your confidence. You know, sometimes the reason we don't have peace is because we're not trusting Him. And some of you are here today, and listen, you say, Kevin, man, life's just beating the tar out of me. 
I'm hurting, I'm tired, I'm weary. Life's not going good. My finances are bad. My marriage is bad. Things are, are just in a bad way in my life. And I don't have any peace. My life is filled with anxiety and frustration and emptiness and I'm hurting and I don't even know how I'm going to make it through. Here's how the peace can come back in. When you take advantage of the invitation that Jesus gives us all, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. He wants you to give you Him your burden. Give Him what, what's stressing you. Give Him what, what's causing you anxiety and pain. And place your confidence and your trust in Him. Listen, I'm talking to some people here today. There's people in this room. You're believers. You're a child of God. And you're not worried about, you're not anxious about, you have peace about the fact that one day you're going to go to heaven. You're not, you're not anxious about that. You're not worried about the fact that you might die and go to hell. But you're worried about the hell that's going on in your life. And that's what's got you beat up. That's what's caused you to lose your peace. The upright can get uptight, amen? Even believers that just have a lot of stuff going on and it just sucks the life out of us. Here's the verses I want to leave you with. In Philippians chapter 4, look at what Paul said. Don't worry about anything. Quit worrying. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And don't be a whiner and thank Him for what He's done. Amen? Amen. Then you will experience what? In other words, quit taking it on your shoulders. Give your burden to the Lord. And here's the, the kind of peace that it is. It's the kind of peace that exceeds anything we understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. It's a peace that doesn't make sense. It's a peace that helps those who trust in Christ walk away from the graveyard when their heart is pounding and they're empty and hurting because of the loss of their loved one. It's a peace that carries them through and keeps them going. It's a peace that doesn't make sense. It's, it's not logical. When our loved ones hurt us, when the spouse walks out, when the job ends, the bad health report comes. I still have peace. It's going to be all right. It's beyond understanding. Why? Because all my confidence is in Him. I trust Him. All my faith is in Him. It's not on my shoulders. It's on His. You know what would make some of your best, some of you have the best Christmas? If you quit trying to control life and give Him control and turn all your burdens over to Him. And before you walk out of here today, get real about the junk in your life and get it right. Then there'll be peace. Because he is the Prince of Peace. Would you bow with me? As our band comes and we prepare to conclude our service just by worshiping the Lord and having a time of response, I want to ask you, would you today turn your life over to God, quit battling against God and make peace with God. Agree with Him. If you're that person here today and you know you've been fighting against God and today you want to make peace with God and give your life to Him, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, could I ask you to do this? 
If you're that person today, you're searching for peace and you want Jesus to be your Prince of Peace, would you today, just from where you're sitting, raise your hand and say, Kevin, that's me. I've been fighting against God and I want to make peace with God. Anybody, just by your uplifted hand, say, Kevin, I want to turn to Christ today. God bless you. Anyone else? Kevin, I want to make peace with God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Other hands still, still coming up. That, you know what that tells me? There's some that come here today and just in the honesty of the heart, there's not peace. They're fighting against God and you want to get it right. Well, come to Him today. Others of you, you've got burdens and you've got cares. Come to Him today. Give Him your burden. Some of you have broken relationships and broken marriages. Quit fighting against each other as husband and wife and start fighting together. Drive it down. And what a perfect time at Christmas to just get before the Lord and say, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord together. Who needs to do that? You can't tell me that me and my wife are not are the only ones that need to get before God and say, God, just once again, rule, rule in us. Who's got the humility to kneel and just drive it down before Jesus and with Jesus? Bring your peace and settle it in our souls. Those of you that raised your hands and said, I want to make peace with God. I, I want to quit fighting against God. In just a moment, we're going to stand our feet. Brent is going to be standing right here to my right. Mark is going to be standing to my left. And I'll be over here. I'd love to share with you. Brent would love to share with you. Mark would love to share with you about how peace can be experienced today through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you, if that was you today, come, take them by the hand and say, I want peace. That's all you got to say. I want peace. And we'll share with you. Let's stand together. Come just as you are.